Well, thanks for the invitation to come back again. Uh, I grew up in New York and spent some time in Connecticut, and I miss the mountains and the seashore. Uh, I don't have either one of them in central Illinois. A lot of corn and soybean, but this is not a good year for corn or soybean. It's a tough year. Uh, but what I'll talk about today are two different programs of research and two different training strategies as a means to examine uh, potential changes in brain and cognition as a function of things we choose to do in life, call them lifestyle factors. Uh, there's certainly a number of possibilities that are explored uh, these days in terms of um, lifestyle choices that we might make from uh, food, uh, some, some work that we've recently started with support from Abbott Nutrition, uh, fitness that I know a number of you are interested in and physical activity and I'll talk a little bit about today uh, less so than the last time I was here uh, the importance of social interactions and social context not something I'll talk about today but uh, another factor that can be neuroprotective by virtue of uh, a number of epidemiological or prospective observational studies and then something I will talk about today and that is uh, cognitive training and cognitive training is a is an interesting uh, issue and certainly a growing uh, cottage industry of research and intellectual property. And uh, this is actually, um, I'm, I'm not endorsing anything, but this is um, the front cover of a, a software package which is designed to enhance memory, decision making, attention, uh, sensory processing, and so forth. And th this is one of the few products, there are many, many products, in fact, uh, a graduate student uh, recently um, Googled brain training for me and uh, um, got about, I don't know how many hits, but uh, the most recent where I heard about the number of hits was about 80 million. So brain training has become a hot topic. There are many products. There's a lot of hype and not much science. This product is an interesting one, Brain Fitness. It's by a company called Posit Science. And again, I don't endorse anything. I have no stock in any company. Uh, but this is a company started by a member of our National Academy of Sciences. Some of you may know his name. His name is Mike Mersnick, and Mike has done wonderful work on plasticity, mostly in monkey models, uh, but more recently humans. And what he's attempted to do, uh, he's had a few forays into the commercial world, one of them with Fast Forward, uh, a, pr a program uh, to purportedly uh, train dyslexics to make phonemic distinctions that are difficult to make, some success early on, maybe not so much success later. Uh, and more recently, this package, which is based on research on plasticity, often in animal models, but some human work as a way to address cognitive decline as a function of aging and to work with a number of clinical populations. <clears throat> but, it, but it is interesting that very few of these packages, uh, he is not the big seller. Mike has become wealthy, but not that wealthy. Uh, I often sit down with billionaires. Part of my job is to do fundraising. So Mike is only a millionaire. That's not that wealthy <laughs> in my world anymore of part of what I do. But uh, me personally, it would be a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but there are big companies like Nintendo that have products called Big Brain Academy and Brain Age that make the big bucks. And I actually, they have a talking head, a researcher on some of their products. And I actually uh, asked him how, how that arrangement works because this is a neuroscientist. <clears throat> from Japan, and he said, well, I, you know, my royalties were $2 million last year. So these are potentially big markets. The question is, do we have the science to justify the products, and what kind of science do we need, and what kinds of claims are made? And uh, I'm not developing a product here, but I will tell you a little bit about the science that I've been doing, and uh, that starts with uh, the next slide. And what we've been looking at, and, and most recently, this work has been funded by something called a MURI. This is a multidisciplinary research initiative from the Office of Naval Research. These are uh, transdisciplinary research programs that are competitive. Usually there's a request for proposals put out. And in this case, I believe ONR received 35 of them and uh, funded two. And my colleague on this project, a uh, number of colleagues at the University of Illinois, Dan Simon, some of you have seen the gorilla video, same guy, uh, Monica Fabiani, Gabriele Gratton, uh, Wei Tat Fu, uh, but also a collaborator at uh, MIT, and her name is Ann Graybill. And uh, Ann, Ann is interested in uh, characterizing learning in the basal ganglia and the prefrontal cortex uh, using single unit and multiple unit recording in macaques, spider monkeys, and uh, other kinds of non-human primates. And this was an attempt to put together the non-human primate work uh, with human work across different methodological techniques and different uh, species 
to examine um, learning, its instantiation of the brain, and also uh, potentially transfer of training, prediction of learning, and so forth. But the, the project I'll tell you about today is just a subset of what we've been doing as part of this um, joint project with, with Anne and MIT. Uh, and one strategy that we've been exploring, a training strategy, most of the learning work uh, done in, in the world that I live in is done looking at practice effects and not giving people specific training strategies as we might in education. But this training strategy, it's called variable priority or variable emphasis training, is a strategy that's been around for a number of years. In fact, it was first introduced uh, by a fellow by the name of Danny Gopher from the Technion in, uh, in Israel. And he used it in a very applied setting that I'll tell you about in a minute. But uh, the way to think about variable priority training is um, often when we think about training complex tasks that have many moving parts, what we might call multiple tasks, there are really two dominant ways of training. And one is part task training, in which we take the parts, we take the uh, coherent parts apart and train the parts separately and then put them back together. And the notion there is it's much easier and much more manageable for individuals to focus on parts. Think of driving as an example or learning to fly a small aircraft. There are so many moving parts there that it might make sense to focus on some of them and not all of them and then gradually put them together. And the other end of the continuum is called whole task training. And the notion there is we train the whole task, you get to do everything, but the downside is that you often get overwhelmed by the hard task. I remember many years ago when I learned how to fly uh, small aircraft, there, there are so many different things you have to remember. You certainly have to be able to, uh, to tune your psychomotor skills to be able to fly the aircraft, take it off, fly it, and, and land it. But you have to listen to air traffic control, and you have to do navigational planning and a bunch of other things. And I remember the experience at first when I was a young uh, novice pilot. Uh, I was listening to air traffic control, and I had to ask my, uh, my instructor, who has, just like an instructor in an auto automobile, a separate control yoke and control, so just in case they need to take over the control of the aircraft, they can. I, I said to him, I, didn't, I, I don't think I'm listening to English when the air traffic controller is talking to me. And it was perfectly uh, good English. It's just it was a lot of jargon. And at the time, I had to pay attention to the air traffic controller. I'm also trying to take off, which is kind of a high stress time or land. So he would take care of the con communication, more of a part task kind of thing, and I would take care of other aspects. So there are advantages both for part task training and whole task training, and there are disadvantages. I, the way I think about variable priority training is it sits kind of smack dab in the middle of this continuum. You get to train the parts, but in the context of the whole. And we could think of this as driver training in which you have a driving instructor, and he might take care or she might take care of scanning for pedestrians and other vehicles, and you're worrying about keeping the automobile between the white lines. So something or somebody else, we might call it artificial intelligence, or it might be a human, would take care of other components, and you'd shift priorities uh, between or among the different components, but you'd also get the benefit of the whole, the context, to see how these parts are executed in the whole. And that's essentially what I've told you. The points are below here. So this is an attempt to bring the best of whole task and part task training in complex situations with complex multitask uh, situations uh, to, uh, to training. There have been a number of studies done over the years on um, the benefits and potential costs of variable priority training. And the references, some of the references are on the bottom here. But uh, in these studies, almost all behavioral, and that's something we're going to change here, um, the research I'll tell you about. But in these studies, uh, variable priority training is compared to fixed priority, uh, you know, a whole task or part task, sometimes called fixed priority for the whole task has led to faster rates of learning and higher levels of mastery in learning new complex skills, uh, greater transfer of training to other tasks requiring substantial executive and attentional control. And the original work that Danny Gopher did, he's a human factors psychologist, was in the Israeli military and they were having this terrible problem back in the early 90s where a number of the, the young people uh, came into training. It's very expensive to train people on uh, high performance aircraft and they were washing out after spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Danny actually showed that this kind of training works very well in such a complex task as flying high performance aircraft. Uh, greater retention and greater resistance to distractions. So there are a number of benefits then for this kind of training that have been demonstrated mostly in behavioral experiments, mostly in the lab but sometimes that was a uh, fixed wing aircraft was done by Sandy Hart and her colleagues at NASA Ames Research. And the, uh, sorry, the fixed wing was done in Israel and the rotary wing was done at NASA Ames. 
But there are a few questions that haven't been addressed, uh, and they have to go. They have to do with mechanism. And the, the questions that we wanted to ask in, in our research team at the University of Illinois uh, have to do with whether we can use some modern day uh, neuroimaging techniques to provide some insights into the mechanisms that underlie the strategies and training benefits of this particular kind of training strategy, which is shown to be quite efficacious in a number of behavioral studies anyway, as compared to more traditional training strategies. Um, and these are some of the questions. I'll get back to them in a second. And, you know, the, some of the, the ways that we've gone about, the methods that we've used, we've gone back and forth and tried to provide cross-fertilization from the monkey research. That's from our colleague Ann Graybill. Uh, some of the, the uh, motivation of the kinds of questions we've asked and how we've asked them. And believe it or not, Ann has uh, the monkeys playing very, very, very impoverished video games because we use video games. Uh, some of them we've designed and some of them other people have designed. But let me tell you a little bit about the context. And this is the, uh, the context in which we've investigated some of the, the, the two main questions that I had up on the, on the slide and I'll get to again in a second. This is a, 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 for the young people in the room, this is a video game. You probably don't remember Pac-Man, but the older folks in the room do. This is a video game that was uh, written many, many years ago. In fact, back in the, uh, in the 70s, uh, the early... Uh, well, the, the mid-70s and late 70s. And I know because I wrote some of the code for it. So this was a video game that we put together based on a number of the cognitive paradigms at the time, including the Sternberg memory search and some Posner queuing and other paradigms. Also some manual control work. Uh, that's, those, that's the part of the code I wrote uh, to make it fairly challenging. This is a video game that builds up from the bottom from these paradigms to study aspects of memory and attention executive control, decision-making, psychomotor control, in which we own the source code. And the difficulty of using video games now, and they're really entertaining and the people keep engaged in them, unlike the kinds of tasks we use in cognitive laboratories, which are boring and might be very focused, but hard to keep people doing them, like a working memory task is pretty, pretty much, it's like watching paint peel off the wall. It's about that boring. So there are interesting tasks for a number of reasons. And this task, which I'll show you in a second, and again, remember these are graphics from many, many years ago, uh, is well characterized in about 20 published articles. It's been used as a platform to look at different training strategies uh, built by cognitive scientists and psychologists. Uh, lots of interesting measures. Remember, we owe the source code started out in assembly language, which is a real bear to write, uh, and now exists in Python and Java. Anybody that wants it can have it. It's highly modifiable. And here's what it looks like. I promised that it's going to be hard to see with the lights up, but uh, I don't know if we can turn them down. But there's a sketch here of this uh, hexagon. Uh, there's this little spaceship thing here that you control. For those of you that have a little bit of an engineering background, it's a second order system in a frictionless environment. That means really hard to control, lots of inertia to get started, hard to stop, hard to turn. There's a space fortress in the middle here that shoots at you. Uh, you have to shoot back it, uh, at it with precise timing. Lots of symbols appear on the screen. They tell you to do different things at different times. And there are lots of uh, scores on the bottom. You can see at the bottom here, lots of different ways to get points and, and lots of different ways to emphasize different aspects of resource management, uh, aspects of memory, aspects of psychomotor control, and aspects of attention. So all of these uh, paradigms, I guess they went in the wrong direction. Uh, so you navigate the ship, which is pretty hard. You avoid missiles and under certain environmental conditions that are, are cued by these symbols. Fire at the fortress, identify uh, various things that come up and behave appropriately. Do a lot of monitoring and resource management to get points in various different ways. So this game, although pretty boring graphically, although it looks a little better on the screen than, than it does here, requires a high degree of cognitive control, requires monitoring multiple sources of information, scheduling and planning different actions based on environmental contingencies to maximize scores, exercise inhibition when appropriate, you can't always make the same action, depends upon the context, uh, switching between component tasks, maintaining multiple goals and sub-goals. So it sounds a lot like executive control and attentional control with aspects of memory and psychomotor control thrown in, and that's exactly what it is, and it's all modifiable through parameters. So we use this test battery as a way to address this issue of the underlying mechanisms, uh, one of the issues, um, and the efficacy of this variable priority training strategy. And this is the way, pictorially, the experiments went. Uh, we tended to put people in 
MRI machines because we were interested in brain structure and function, both for prediction and, examine, and examining strategies and proficiencies that are acquired uh, through this training. We used EEG and event-related brain potentials and something called diffusive optical imaging. Some of you have heard of NEARS, near-infrared spectroscopy. It's a kind of a cheap way with some downsides uh, to measure brain blood flow and something called EROS, which many of you haven't heard of, I'm sure. And I think of that as an optical electrical analog. It looks like an EEG or ERPs, but doesn't have the inverse problem, so spatial localization is, is possible. But I'll just tell you about a subset, subset of the, uh, the measures and the, the studies today. And then we had a whole bunch of transfer tasks from flying in a high, high performance aircraft simulation. We have great simulators at the Beckman Institute. Uh, to other more laboratory-based neurological and neuropsychological tests. So the first experiment we'll look at asked a really simple question, and, and that's the question on the bottom here, and we had a few experiments that addressed this issue. Uh, can the training paradigms that we and others have developed be used as platforms to examine? Uh, and I think of this as the, qu the issue is beyond psychometrics. So in psychometrics, we use neuropsychological tests to predict how someone might learn or how, someone, how so well someone might do in a job or so forth. But our question here is whether we can go beyond psychometrics, go beyond behavioral tests designed to predict proficiency, learning, and mastery, and so forth, and use some of these measures from MRI, structural measures, and fMRI, more functional measures, as compared to more traditional, these psychometric or performance-based uh, techniques. Uh, so we, can we account for residual variance, and does that residual variance and the means with which we account for it give us some uh, insights into what's being learned and the mechanisms of learning? And the first question was really pretty simple, uh, was, uh, and it was predicated on work by Ann Graybill and others, and that is, uh, is bigger better? and is bigger uh, in a particular region of the brain called the corpus striatum of the basal ganglia uh, better in terms of simply volume. Can we use, after we first accounted for uh, variance in learning, and learning this new complex but b maybe not so graphically uh, beautiful uh, video game, uh, can we use the size of three different nuclei, the nucleus accumbens, the putamen and the caudate nucleus in, in the basal ganglia, which we know from monkey and other studies, it supports at least two of these nuclei, the putamen and the caudate nucleus, new learning of new procedural skills, the ability to, to be flexible, to shift priorities in, in collaboration with the prefrontal cortex, and the nucleus accumbens in a region of the basal ganglia that supports reward. Can we use the size of these nuclei simply in humans to predict residual variance in learning on this complex task? And everything I show you will be after we first factored out uh, in multiple hierarchical multi multiple, multiple regression equations, the contributions from uh, performance or psychometric measures, which are pretty small, as is the case for the most part. So what we have here on the x-axis, we have learning phase, and each of those numbers represents five hours of training. So we have 20 hours of training. And on the y-axis, uh, the correlation coefficient between size of these nuclei and learning. One learning score, we have many scores and we can look at this with many, but uh, this is just a, a simplification. And what we see here is that the, the two brain nuclei uh, that have already been shown to be related to new learning and flexibility and so forth are relatively stable in terms of the amount of variance they account for, whereas the nucleus accumbens, when things are new, there's a lot of excitement and reward, tends to downtrend uh, after a short period of time. So the answer to our first question is that yes, we can account for re residual variance and uh, a, a small amount, but a, but a reasonable amount. And we've actually replicated, everything I tell you about has been replicated in, in either two or three different experiments. And in some cases, in the initial experiment, we use Monte Carlo analysis and bootstrap analysis to do a within study replication or cross validation. But everything's been replicated multiple times. But you know, we thought we could do better than what we get purely from structure. Actually, this is what the game looks like. Still pretty boring, but at least a bit more colorful. And th the question is, what, kind of, uh, what additional information? And again, we're still just focus, fo focusing on the basal ganglia. So this is not a scattershot approach. We're ta taking one region of cortex uh, that's play, that we know plays an important role in new learning, and we're focusing on that. Can we do better by looking at other regions? Well, that's an interesting question we're exploring now, and one would think so since the prefrontal cortex coordinates often with the basal ganglia and various aspects of executive control and learning. But uh, the, the question we'll ask now is can we take 
we have MRI data, we have fMRI data, the structural and the functional data. And uh, one question we can ask is with the functional data, now not the structural data, uh, kind of a simple first question is can we do a binary prediction and can we do it with fairly reasonable sensitivity and specificity? And uh, we did that by dividing our 40 subjects in this initial experiment, 75 in the second and another 35 in the third. Again, we've cross-validated this both within and between uh, studies by looking at the basal ganglia and just doing a median split in terms of how much you've learned. And our sensitivities and specificities were in the high 0.8s, so reasonable sensitivity and specificities. But maybe that's too easy. Maybe what we want to do is make point prediction, predictions, scalar predictions, predictions. That is, we want to predict the absolute scores that people get after the 20 hours of training. So we have an illustration here of one technique we use, kind of our uh, baseline or beginning technique. On the y-axis, we have the measured score improvement, and people improve, usually they start out with negative points because it's a really hard task, uh, and that's correlated with the mean bold activity using fMRI uh, bold signal. And this is mean within the, the um, dorsal striatum, just the caudate and the putamen, because the nu nucleus accumbens doesn't contribute much. So about 16 to 17% uh, of the variance. Um, I'll skip over this. But we, we know from the, the literature on human perception that there are a number of interesting techniques uh, that come out of electrical engineering and applied mathematics that can be applied to the kinds of data we acquire, these three-dimensional voxels, kind of like three-dimensional pixels, even within restricted re regions, and this is restricted, it's, remember it's just the caudate and the putamen, uh, to, to capitalize on the spatial distribution of these activated voxels. And one of these techniques is called multi-voxel pattern analysis, and it's used along with a nonlinear uh, regression called support vector regression to attempt to squeeze more information out of the data, but capitalizing on the spatial distribution, not just simply an average within a region of interest. And the way we do this is, initially at least, we use this jackknife or, or leave one out cross-validation uh, technique where we build a mathematical model based on all the data but one. We classify uh, that data and then we put it back in and pull another one out and do it in a Monte Carlo way. We use this support vector nonlinear regression to predict uh, score improvement based on the spatial distribution of activated voxels within the caudate and the putamen. That's simply what it is. And then we cross-validate across experiments too. So on the left-hand side, we have the data that I showed you with the, the mean bold activity. And on the right-hand side, we have the data uh, from this multi-voxel pattern analysis capitalizing on the spatial distribution. <laughs> So what these data suggest is absolutely there's important information in the spatial de uh, definition of uh, the spatial distribution of these activated voxels. And this can inform us, that, number one, it can be useful in terms of uh, predicting learning. And remember, this 54% of the variance we can predict on the right-hand side there in is in addition to about the 15% of the variance we can predict uh, with the uh, psychometric tests and another uh, few percentage of the variance with the structural data. So we can actually account for a reasonable amount of data. We've cross-validated this on two different samples and uh, now doing some other interesting things I'd be happy to tell you about. The interesting aspect of these data, however, for those of you, how many people know fMRI? I know a few of them do here. Okay, so in, in fMRI, everything's relative. You do a contrast and you look at uh, activation on one condition versus another condition. But when we, when we look at this contrast, and that's, that's the, the basis of, of the bold contrast, the blood oxygen level dependent contrast that we use, mostly use in fMRI. Uh, but when we do that kind of comparison, we throw out some important data. And that is the, con the constant or consistent data that gets averaged out because it's the same in condition A and condition B. Uh, technically, it's called T2 star. And we all have it. We all collect it when we collect fMRI data. We don't throw it away. I bet you have it in the file. But we average it out because it's not the difference. It's not the contrast between condition A and condition B. This classification is not from the bold signal. This classification is simply from the T2 star that we mostly throw away. And then the interesting question became, because the functional activation, the bold contrast, didn't predict a whole lot of the variance. Then the question uh, becomes, what's the physiological basis of this constant signal that we throw away when we do the contrast? 
in uh, the bold fMRI contrast. Well, this required a student who just finished her PhD in electrical engineering and is now a professor at Ho Chi Minh, uh, you know, International University in Ho Chi Minh City in, in Vietnam, Lone Vo. And Lone attacked uh, attack this question by using a number of different pulse sequences that are sensitive to different aspects of brain blood flow, uh, different as, uh, aspects of uh, integrity of white matter, something called diffusion tensor imaging, flow was ASL or arterial spin labeling, and uh, other sequences that are sensitive to specific uh, uh, constituents of, uh, of uh, proteins and so forth in the brain, something called susceptibility weighting in, uh, imaging. And after running all these different pulse sequences and looking at the relative contribution and uh, doing various uh, factoring various factors out, the bottom line seems to be that it's the non-hem iron, the ferritin, that exists within the basal ganglia within normal range, pretty interesting, that seems to be the predictive component that gives us that 0.74 correlation. There are lots of interesting issues. We're now running animal models where we can manipulate iron and looking at human models of iron deficiency. But these are not people that are iron deficient. So this was a, an interesting discovery uh, for an aspect of this data that predicts learning quite well within normal iron concentrations in the brain uh, that we normally don't look at. So that's part of that story. But the next question here is how, uh, the next question I'll tell you about, is how is uh, variable priority training as compared to more traditional whole task training uh, reflected in changes in underlying brain networks? So can understanding of the brain networks, even in the crude sense we get from functional magnetic resonance imaging, we're not putting in single units, Anne does that, but she can't put them in many places in her monkeys, and uh, she certainly can't have monkeys do the complexity of tasks that we have our humans do. So can brain network changes uh, inform differences in cognitive processes associated with different training strategies? Uh, and this is via the analysis of a, a technique, uh, a number of different techniques, uh, but regional connectivity in a functional, not a structural sense. Of course, we can look at structural connectivity. So in the, f in the first set of experiments, I was telling you about the pre-session, uh, uh, the pre-training session. Can we predict training? Uh, in this set of analysis, I'll tell you about the pre and the post because we did similar analyses and ran similar paradigms prior to and subsequent uh, to the training. And the, the analyses uh, were both functional data, that is data collected as people played the video games with reverse engineered fiber optic uh, joysticks and the magnet and button boxes and all the things we had to build that don't exist, um, hence having uh, bioengineers involved and, and MR physicists is a good idea in some of this work and we work with them. This is clearly an interdisciplinary team but looking at the behavioral changes not just in learning but in other tasks, EEG, fMRI and so forth. But we'll stick, in this case we are looking at the bold contrast. But let me first tell you about the performance which was pretty interesting. And ONR, the Office of Naval Research supports this so I occasionally present to groups of uh, Navy uh, civilian researchers and military folks including admirals. And I was a little hesitant to do this uh, two years ago when I first presented it because I, I said, well, you know, the, r the red line here is the variable priority. This is, these are learning functions over sessions, two hours a session, 20 hours of training, and this is the score improvement. So variable priority training certainly leads to higher levels of mastery and uh, more rapid learning rates, and that's a good thing. Uh, but look over on the right-hand side. We decided because we were interested in individual differences, so not, not just practice but training, um, but also individual differences, people that start out with much higher proficiency than others in this in doing really complex things, which is correlated somewhat with fluid intelligence. But we split the subjects into these two groups. This happened to be simply a median split, and the, the dashed lines on the top are from people that started out pr playing pretty well. So, um, and we see here that um, the training strategy, whether the fixed priority or the whole task, which is blue, or the variable priority, the one we're interested in the red, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Some difference, but very little. But when we take those 50% of the individuals who don't start out very well, we see a huge benefit uh, from this strategy that focuses on flexibility, uh, cognitive flexibility, and so forth, shifting priorities among different components of the task with feedback. So when I presented this to the admirals, I was a little nervous because they, were, they, they think of things differently than us scientists and is this relevant to what we do? And uh, I got up and presented it and one of the admirals got up and said, Art, this is exactly what we need. Do you think we get Rhodes Scholars? 
Well, not always, I don't think you can get wrong. So the fact that the effects are larger for the group that started out poorly, I'm still not sure you need Rhodes Scholars to do this, but we, we have a look at it. So there are a number of different networks we can look at. And this is just simply a pictorial representation color-coded on these uh, uh, brain representations uh, on the left, right, and middle here of different networks. One of them is called a default mode network. And one way to think about that is the default mode is the yin to the yang of um, activated networks when you're processing information for the environment. Some have said it's due to reminiscence, essentially processing information internally. And it's an interesting network. It's color-coded in red here because this is a network that shows uh, effects uh, due to aging and connectivity and activation and due to various forms of neuropathology. So this is a network that's clinically relevant as well as developmentally relevant uh, that seems to be active when we're processing information internally without any m or much external stimulation. The two other networks, the frontal executive and frontal parietal, the, what, what they seem to do by virtue of a, a large and, and increasing literature is listed on the top. Uh, the frontal executive network seems to uh, support stable, sus uh, sustained maintenance of task set. Remember what you're supposed to do, monitoring for errors and maintaining associations between actions and outcomes of actions. The frontal parietal is a network um, that, and this is work done by Maurizio, Maurizio Corbetta and others, Steve Peterson, a number of other people, uh, is thought to support rapid online filtering of attention, fil uh, attending to some things, not other things, top-down control, and aspects of working memory. And these are a few of the networks we we're interested in uh, that might provide insights into the strategies that are being learned uh, as performance is being enhanced by this cognitively flexible variable priority uh, training strategy as compared to the more traditional fixed priority or, or uh, whole task training. Uh, just briefly to, to put you on the same page, so everybody's on the same page pretty much, one way to look at connectivity, simply put, is univariate connectivity between point A and point B. And the illustration of these two little brains on the top would be illustrations of the motor cortex on the left and right hand side when you're doing a bimanual coordination task. And we can see from the, the uh, time uh, by signal uh, plot on the top that these two uh, different sides of the brain are coordinated pretty well if you're doing the same actions with the right and the left hand. Now that doesn't need to be the case. Here we have uh, at one point in the occipital cortex and another one in uh, the temporal lobes. And whatever task was being done here didn't re require the coordination of two, two different areas. And hence we see a lot more randomness and, and a much smaller correlation. So this is the, the idea behind connectivity analysis. It can be done in a univariate sense and it can be done in a multivariate sense with techniques like Granger causality and graph theory. We prefer graph theory, but um, it's just a preference. So, so what I'm going to do is filter down a tremendous amount of data that took uh, months and months to analyze. Uh, <coughs> these are huge data sets and tell you about, uh, tell you an interesting story and then you can decide if you buy it or not. By the way, this is uh, published in a journal called Neuroimage. Uh, Michelle Voss is the first author. So what we were interested in is both the coherence or cross products or covariance among different regions in these networks that I showed you, these three different networks as a function of training strategy and over time, pre to post. So how do these networks change? And how does that, what we know about the network, inform us about the strategies and what people are learning? But we wanted to go a step further. Well, a couple of steps further. I'll tell you about one step now. And one step further is not just to look at the correlation or covariance within the network, within these networks, but to look at the relationship between that co covariance, covariation, and covariation of two, and two other regions who aren't part of the network, at least in a major sense. And one of them is the medial temporal lobes, uh, flagged by those little red dots, or actually the hippocampus. And we know that the medial temporal lobes are very important in relational, episodic, declarative memory. That is, putting different pieces of information into a coherent whole, like remembering a face with a name, with a profession, with what you discussed when you met somebody. And also, we're back now to the basal ganglia here. Uh, the caudate and the putamen are flagged on that slice on, on the right-hand side. The relationship between these networks, or I should say change in the networks from post, after training, to pre, and to these two regions because the basal ganglia plays a role, we know, in procedural learning. So we have two different regions that might change in their relationship to these other networks based on the strategies and what the strategies are emphasizing, whether flexible, declarative knowledge or uh, more procedural knowledge. 
And what we have here, and then we have two of the networks flagged on the top with those two little brains, the frontal parietal and the frontal executive. Uh, the variable priority is in blue and the fixed priority in, is in yellow. And what we have is a very different pattern here, the variable priority connectivity with the medial temporal lobes up on the left hand side increases pretty dramatically over learning purportedly on the basis of learning uh, the strategies that might be used in this fairly cognitively flexible training technique, learning different strategies when they're appropriate and so forth. So learning a lot of relational information. Uh, that's true for the frontal uh, executive uh, network for the fixed priority condition. But if we move over to the right hand side, the right hand plot, we see a different, very different panel. And in this case, it's the fixed priority, this whole task training, rather than shifting priorities in terms of training, uh, that the connectivity increases with the region of the brain, the basal ganglia, the caudate, and the putamen, uh, that plays more of a role in procedural learning. So one might say then that the fixed priority training is more procedural, at least with respect to this very flexible uh, frontal parietal network, uh, whereas the variable priority training is more based on rules that might be used depending upon the environmental circumstances and so forth. We can also look at individual subjects, and in this case, this is a plot of post minus pre functional co connectivity of the frontal parietal network with the hippocampus of the medial temporal lobes as uh, compared on the y axis to learning rate for this game. And we can see for the variable priority condition that even across individuals, more change in functional connectivity leads, again, with this network with the medial temporal lobes of the hippocampus, this flexible form of declarative knowledge leads to better uh, game scores. So people who could, for one reason or another, uh, increase connectivity uh, showed uh, larger scores or vice versa. It's simply a correlation. I've added a whole bunch, uh, another set of plots on the bottom. But one way to simply think about that is I've just doubled the number of bars. And the reason I've doubled the number of bars is we wanted to bring in individual differences. <coughs> That's, this is based on the simp simple median split between people that started out doing well, that had some of the tools going into the task, and people who didn't. And what we see here in pretty much each of these plots is an exaggeration of what we saw on the top, collapsed across good performers and poor performers. And the bottom line here is that people that started doing poorly showed a much larger change in connectivity and correlation either with the medial temporal lobes on the left or on the uh, basal ganglia on the right. So I think uh, w what we've gained uh, from adding some neuroimaging measures here to what we might have already known from the behavioral data is more of a, and a, and more of a, uh, and a deeper insight into the kinds of strategies that people learn, the kinds of skills they develop uh, as they are trained with different uh, training techniques and as they differ in terms of the tools they bring to the task as, uh, in terms of the individual differences. So I think bringing to the, together the behavioral and functional brain data here can provide some interesting uh, additional insights. So uh, for this more than half of the talk, uh, we clearly, I think we clearly can do better than behavioral prediction of individual differences in learning and uh, enhance our understanding of how brain differences contribute to learning. Uh, we learned that spatial patterns and individual differences in regional activation are important and provide some insights about the, the sub-areas, the sub-components of the nuclei we're looking at in terms of learning from this multi-voxel pattern analysis. And different learning strategies display differential changes in connectivity with different brain networks and performance over the course of training. But there's a lot we don't know and some of which we're exploring now. For example, to what extent do our regionally limited examination of individual differences extend to other brain areas? Remember, we just looked at the corpus striatum, uh, the basal ganglia, the dorsal basal ganglia, actually, for most of this work. And we know that the basal ganglia plays a coordinative role with the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex and so forth. So what if we exp expand our horizons, expand our viewpoint here? Uh, can we actually show better prediction? Can we understand uh, the networks? in a more sophisticated way. Some of the network analysis gets to that. And what about different tasks and processes? The, the Space Fort Fortress task is complex from a cognitive and, and psychomotor uh, viewpoint, uh, but probably more complex from the psychomotor viewpoint. What about more cognitive tasks? To what extent can we enhance brain structure and function and in turn improve learning and cognition? That is, are some of these measures, are they malleable, such as structure and function? such that we can put people in particular states and uh, actually enhance learning rate based on structure, volume, or function. 
And I think we need to know much more about the nature of individual differences, including patient populations in the brain that contribute to the prediction of learning. So that's the cognitive training. And just briefly, in the last 15 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about uh, fitness training. So we know that physical fitness reduces the risk of developing a variety of diseases. Uh, but what impact does it have on the short term on cognition and brain health? And here's a typical American male, uh, not getting much activity. Uh, certainly we all need more activity, both uh, older folks and humans. And I, I, I presented this the last time I was here, and Henrietta von Prague and, and Monica Fleschner and Rod Dishman did a great job of going over this. But the main point, without going over all the details of the slide, is that we know uh, fitness or physical activity, especially of an aerobic nature, we know a lot about it at, a, at the molecular and cellular level. We know that fitness, in, improvements in fitness or running on a running wheel for the rodents can actually engender neurogenesis in the hippocampus, and those are the little green dots from Rusty Ga Gage's lab on the top. It can increase neurotrophins that are neuroprotective, such as, like, uh, such as brain derived neurotrophin factor and IGF 1, synaptogenesis through increased spine density, additional connections, angiogenesis in terms of increased vascularization, and a whole variety of other changes. So we know a lot about, not everything, but we know a lot about the molecular and cellular changes from animal models that we can then apply to uh, the kinds of experiments we design with humans. In fact, in some ways, I think that fitness is ideal because uh, both humans and uh, uh, non-human animals such as rodents can do the same tasks just fine, whereas the cognitive tasks sometimes it's a bit more challenging to have a mouse test of fluid intelligence. But there's a, a physiologist at Rutgers, some of you may know him, Lou Matzel, who's coming up with just that, which is really neat, I think, to be able to look at human and animal models of higher level cognitive processes. But the way the human interventions work are really pretty simple. We tend to have two or more groups. These days we have an intervention with four. Uh, but one group tends to be, at least initially in these studies, an aerobic group as Mr. or Ms. Ms. Centipede uh, talked about walking as being the best exercise. So it tends to be walking, bicycling, or swimming, or aerobic exercise in the pool. And then we need an active control group, because every good study does. And that's what Mr. Gumby didn't do well, stretching, toning, and light strengthening. That tends to be the control group. And we tend to run these groups three days a week, about an hour a day. Uh, with our older adults, we start off with professional couch potatoes. And uh, they gradually become uh, less sedentary. Uh, and they increase the distance and the speed with which they go. It, the interventions tend to run anywhere from about six months, three days a week, to about a year, most of the interventions. And we measure changes in cognition, psychosocial function, quality of life, and brain structure, structure and function. We occasionally take some blood measures. So here's some data published a few years ago. In, uh, this, these are simply a double subtraction. <coughs> uh, two slices parallel to the floor, and then a sagittal slice in the middle of the, the brain. Uh, and these are differences of differences. This is after minus before, walkers minus the toners, so the aerobic group minus the control group. And anything in blue, or actually, and, and by the way, this, uh, this group, I think the average age is almost 70. So these are older folks who are increasing the volume of gray matter, those little patches in blue in the anterior cingulate and medial frontal gyrus and white matter, that's the anterior commissure that connects the, the two hemispheres. So these are the first data I know of that show increases in brain volume in older adults that in other studies are related to changes in performance uh, as a function of in, uh, an intervention. I'm going to skip that one. We can also dig down into particular nuclei, and in this, this study was published last year uh, by uh, Kirk Erickson from our lab and now an assistant professor at Pittsburgh. And there are a couple of control regions, but we were interested in the hippocampus, the regions flagged on the top, uh, based on the animal research on neurogenesis in the hippocampus. And I'm not suggesting the data I show you here from humans uh, are, are due to neurogenesis. I don't know. We can't do the histology. Nobody ever volunteers. But what, what I can tell you is that the blue line is from those individuals who are in the walking group over the year, and the red uh, line uh, from those individuals, and this is a measurement three times before six months in a year, from the uh, toning and stretching active control group, which show typical decline for a 70-year-old, 60 to 80 years of age, whereas the walkers show an increase, uh, which when we look at trajectories of change in hippocampal volume over the lifespan, we can think of the percent uh, increase is equivalent to about a two-year pushback on personal trajectories. 
Uh, we can also ask a little bit more specifically about where in the hippocampus these changes take place, and it just so happens that in humans, the dentate gyrus, where neurogenesis occurs, is in the anterior hippocampus. That's where all the change is, not in the posterior. Again, this does not tell us this is neurogenesis. Could be a number of uh, factors that underlie it, but provides some uh, interesting backup to, as to at least what some of this could be. And then finally, we can look at uh, the relationship between changes in hippocampal volume as a function of uh, walking in the walking group and changes in uh, VO2, which is the kind of gold standard, a VO2 peak or VO2 max in some cases, is the gold standard for cardiorespiratory fitness. It's a treadmill test. Um, in, a, in a hospital, they might call it a stress test or if you have an echocardiogram, a stress echocardiogram in addition to the Treadmill, we see here a relationship between change in hippocampal volume and, and improving fitness. On the second panels, and this is on the left and right hippocampus, change in BDNF, and BDNF is one of these neurotrophins. Again, nobody allows us to do uh, a little snippet of hippocampus, which would be ideal, and you can do that in animals. This is BDNF for blood, from blood. So there's always this question about the relationship between these uh, proteins in the peripheral nervous system or in uh, uh, peripheral blood in the CNS, but still an interesting relationship. And on the bottom with uh, changes in spatial memory performance, a kind of relational memory task. These are data from a more recent study that's in Press uh, Voss et al. in a journal called Human Brain Mapping. And I know it's hard to see, but those little brain panels on the right are flagged with different regions uh, of white matter. This is using diffusion tensor imaging as a way to look at functional integrity of white matter and its change as a function of fitness. And the solid lines represent the walkers. This is the aerobic group. And the uh, dotted lines, the stretchers, and we can see uh, a nice relationship in a variety of regions you can't see because you can't see the little green uh, traces on the brain maps here. And it's probably too fuzzy to read uh, these plots here. But a number of changes in white matter integrity um, as a function of this particular measure. Another interesting aspect of the, the fitness uh, training is that uh, for the most part, cognitive training tends to have specific effects. You train memory, you might get improvements in memory, but not in processing speed or attention and vice versa. Uh, these are data from a meta-analysis, and there have been several since uh, this one here by Stan Kulkum and myself in 2003. The white bars indicate uh, training and walking and other aerobic activities among older adults, and the gray bar is usually toning, stretching, and some light strengthening. And what we've done on the x-axis is uh, broken down the various tasks into executive control, controlled versus automatic, spatial versus speed, and so forth. And if we did it today, there's more good memory tasks that have been used. And what we see are, I think, two interesting effects. One is across the board improvements in the effect size across all of these different cognitive abilities, um, but a bigger improvement for executive control. And if we looked at relational memory there, too. So uh, when I was asked by an admiral uh, in the same meeting when we were talking about cognitive training at an ONR uh, meeting, uh, given all of the ambiguity in cognitive training and the specificity of effects uh, that we see, and not much of a generality, that's kind of the holy Monty Python's holy grail if you can get generality with cognitive training. What we should do, I told the Admiral to go take a hike. So. And he finally got it too. <coughs> Before he shot me. So again, th th these are changes in connectivity, but not with cognitive training, with fitness training. So we could also ask, and the little labels are here from the default network or the frontal executive network. Again, a lot of analysis goes into t to these data, but let me just briefly unpack them. We can look at connectivity in these networks before the, the fitness training, before getting more fit, walking versus toning. And the, the blue bars are the toners, the control group, and the yellow bars, yellowish orange bars are the walkers six months, 12 months. And what we see in all of these panels, or at least most of these panels, is that uh, there's a nice reliable increase in connectivity, the coherence within the network, the communication that's possible uh, in the walkers but not the toners. And by the way, that white bar at the end, uh, remember these folks are 60 to 80, uh, the, the uh, blue bar and the yellow bar. And the white bar at the end uh, represents the young people in the audience. Those are the 20 to 30-somethings. So we know coherence and, and correlation and connectivity decreases as a function of age. And now what we know is it increases as a function of improved fitness among older folks to become, in some cases, equivalent, in some cases, not equivalent, but in the 
same direction as the younger folks. But you know, another question we might want to ask is, uh, okay, so we see changes in connectivity in these networks. This is beyond activation, but connectivity. Uh, is this related to uh, changes in any aspects of cognition? And we created latent variables from a number of different tests of executive control and short-term memory. And what we have here are the correlations between changes in this connectivity in the default mode network and changes in these uh, executive control and short-term memory tasks. And we see small but reliable changes, especially in things like scheduling, planning, dealing with ambiguity, multitasking, and working memory. So the behavior of the networks is related to the behavior uh, on these cognitive tests. I'm going I'm to uh, skip the graph theory stuff, but that's interesting too. I'll skip this. We, we can also get a, a variety of other measures from the MRI and, um, and fMRI. And one set of measures is called magnetic, we can get from um, the spectrum of magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So we can look at different peaks, different metabolites. And the one we look at here is N acetyl aspartate, uh, which is a metabolite that exists often within cells, uh, neurons, and, and uh, glia, perhaps. And we can look at it as a function of fitness level, and we find there's an interesting difference, as a function, especially for the 70 to 80 year olds. That's the older old, but not the younger old. And in relationship to performance on this uh, working memory task called backward mem memory span. So we can use a number of other aspects of performance from structure, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, and volume of gray and white uh, in function and use MRS and of course flow, which I don't have here. But one question we're often asked is, uh, you know, we've done most of our work with older folks and we were interested in aging and whether there are uh, various interventions and lifestyle choices that can turn around the, the bad news to good news, at least temporarily. But we're also interested both from theor a theoretical perspective in terms of development <coughs> and from a practical uh, perspective in terms of the increased sedentary nature of our young people, whether some of these effects are also observed and how similar they are, dissimilar they are in children. So here are some data from eight to 10 year olds. If we stop at the, uh, start at the top left, one of the kinds of analyses we like to do is called a mediator analysis. And we can look at the relationship on the bottom of the triangle between aerobic fitness and re relational memory. We have some evidence to believe there might be a relationship from the older adult data and some other data we have. And we can ask whether that relationship is mediated by changes in hippocampal volume due to changes in aerobic fitness. And on the bottom, we can look at kids. Again, these are uh, seven to nine-year-old kids. And uh, we can look at non-relational memory. That's remembering just faces, just names, or just what you talked about, or relational memory where you put it all together. Relational memory is what the hipp hippocampus seems to focus on much more than item memory. And we see as a function of fitness, the lower fit kids have much poorer scores than the higher fit kids. If we move to the top right, that's an average for low fit on the left and high fit on the right of uh, the left and right hippocampi. Lower fit kids have a smaller average hippocampus on the, on the left and the right both, but average together most certainly. And on the bottom right, that's the relationship across about 50 children between relational memory on the y-axis and hippocampal volume. So a lot of what I told you with respect to older adults seems to be true with kids. Interestingly, the effects are even broader for children. So one of our control regions uh, for, the, uh, for our examination of the hippocampus with the older folks uh, was the basal ganglia, the caudate and the putamen that played such an interesting role in cognitive training. Not much of a role in fitness, although one might imagine it could with different kinds of fitness tasks that required more motor skill learning. But what we find with kids is that they get increases, they have differences and increases there. We're now doing randomized controlled trials supported by the National Institute of Child and uh, Human Development. Uh, these are just cross-sectional data. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Okay, so let me summarize this part of the talk and I'm pretty much on time. Uh, first, relatively brief fitness interventions with older couch potatoes uh, improve a variety of perceptual and cognitive abilities, so broader effects than cognitive training. Increases brain volumes in regions that normally show age-related decline, including the medial temporal lobes or hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, and other regions. And these changes are correlated with changes in performance. Uh, we observe changes in functional brain networks, often in the direction of younger adults that are also correlated with changes in improved performance, mostly executive control. And I didn't talk about today, but we do work on anxiety, depression, self-esteem, and uh, self-efficacy, and there are interesting stories there, both about what self-efficacy has to look like to get people to stay in such programs and how self-efficacy changes as a fact, fact of uh, function of these programs. 
I'm going to skip the gaps in the knowledge. We can talk about that later, and I'll thank my collaborators. The work that we do, both with the training, cognitive training, and the fitness training is clearly team-based, interdisciplinary work. And there are a number of collaborators in a number of places at Illinois and other universities uh, throughout the United States, uh, formerly in, in Wales and uh, British Columbia. Uh, that's a picture of the Beckman Institute. Thank you.